Hello, sister travelers. Well, do you consider yourself a foodie or do you seek out some culinary experiences during your travels? If that's you, then you are going to enjoy today's conversation I have with a guest, Annie Sim. She's founder and CEO of The Table Less Traveled. So with culinary exploration at the heart of travel experiences, Annie Sim labels herself the CEO, meaning Chief Eating Officer, of The Table Less Traveled. Her love affair with travel began at age 13 when her parents took her out of the U.S. for the first time. The moment she woke up in a thatched roof hut with elephants and giraffes just steps away, everything changed, and she hasn't stopped exploring since. While spending 10 plus years abroad, Annie built lasting relationships with local chefs, business owners, and friends who were people just like her and open to welcoming travelers into their homes. In the spirit of coming together and exploring somewhere new, she founded The Table Less Traveled in 2015, which pairs her love of travel and food with her relationships that extended outside of tourism and distills in an iconic experience of global cultures and creates an intimate and authentic environment to experience them firsthand. Now, when COVID hit, she offered started offering virtual interactive cooking classes through the company, and she likes to connect people, bringing straight from their kitchen to you virtually. Now, the Table Less Travel transports not only work teams, families, solo travelers uh, to Italy, Japan, Peru, and beyond. They also have the virtual shared experiences, as I mentioned, so you can gain a deeper appreciation for destinations around the world. I hope you enjoy the conversation I had with Annie here today about food and the connection it brings to everybody, spanning cultural differences and language. Welcome to Solo Travel Adventures, my sisters. Don't let fear hold you back from traveling alone. I want you to gather your courage, listen to inspiring stories, and learn how to travel solo while safely navigating new places from this show. I'm Cheryl Esch, solo travel advocate and travel coach, and I want you to have a transformative experience when you travel solo. So pack your bags, book your flight, and check one more time for that passport. It's time to explore the world. Hi, Annie. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yes. Well, I'm excited to dive in because I know that I have quite a few listeners that are would consider themselves foodies, right? So I think your concept is really going to, um, they're going to really love it. And I hope to, uh, you know, just kind of hear what your travel story is. You know, how did you get started with this love affair of travel? I always like to hear people's stories. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it starts from a young age. And for me, I think it's a little bit of nature and nurture. And so it probably even starts with my parents and their stories, but I won't bore you with all of the details. Um, you know, I think I get a little bit of a sense of adventure and a desire for exploration from them. My dad is from Malaysia. He grew up on the island of Borneo and he didn't do a lot of travels when he was young, but then when he came to the U.S., obviously that was a very different cultural shift. And my mom is from a small town in central Washington farm country And um, when she was in, I think it was about 19, 20 years old, she um, did a experience where she lived in Africa for, um, I think it was like two years. And so I think that there's this fascination that my parents have always had with different cultures, different people and communities. And I think that they really passed that to me. Awesome. Yes. I know my story kind of goes back to childhood too, where, you know, I just kind of get that sense of adventure as well from, I think, uh, my parents. So I always love to hear, you know, what sparked that for people. So what inspired you to come up with the table less traveled? And can you share exactly what your organization does? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, paths in life for me have never been linear. I think for a lot of people, as you're kind of honing in on something, somebody once told me it's like a heat seeking missile. You're always moving forward, but you're moving left to right. And so I feel like in starting the table less traveled, it was this combination of a lot of different passions that came together. And, um, I 
I feel like the the origin of it really stems from that passion that I had for travel and the desire to explore that, like I mentioned, I think really got handed down from my parents. So when I had an opportunity when I was in college, I did study abroad. I lived with a family in Chile. I didn't speak any Spanish when I got there. I had taken Spanish courses in high school, but I really had not remembered any of it, kept any of it, and never got to the ability to really speak with people. It was very basic. Mm -hmm. And living with this family where I just remember my host mom coming in for the very first time to my room, you know, an hour after I got there and she was speaking to me in Spanish and I was just like a deer in headlights, felt so (laughs) uncomfortable, had no idea what was going on. And finally she was like, do you want to eat? Putting her hand to my her mouth. And I'm like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Food, lunch. I'm hungry. That would be great. I just got off an international flight. And so I think that experience started this deep passion for me of learning about different communities and different people. Because after I had that experience, I felt so much more in tune with a part of myself that I never knew or realized in my own culture. And I don't even think it's something that I can put into words or verbalize, but it was a, a, a realization that there's like a piece of me that connects with different cultures and different places that I go. And so that was one, I think, really formative experience that gave me this insight into being with locals, being mm-hmm. with people was mm-hmm. such a core part of travel for me. And it was very much less about the sites that I saw. And then as that developed, I realized that food was always one of those common languages where exactly what I was talking about with that, um, you know, lack of Spanish capability at the time that we were still able to communicate through our love of food. You know, she taught me how to make her recipes, her dishes, and through those experiences, it helped me learn the language and it Mm. helped me learn about her family. And so when I was a little bit older and had started my first job, I, you know, fell out of love with what I was doing. Although I don't know (laughs) if I was ever in love with it. Um, I loved where I worked, but I didn't necessarily love what I was doing. It was telecom. No offense to you telecom people. Like it's great for people who are passionate about it. That just wasn't my passion. Mm -hmm. And so I left that job and I had taken the money that I had saved to put a down payment on a condo and decided what's going to enrich my life and help me do that heat seeking missile of where my path is. And I did a six month round the world trip where I lived with different families and or stayed with different people that I could meet through my network. And um, that was my whole purpose was really cooking with people, eating meals with them, learning about their culture. And so that was another experience that highlighted for me the importance of those connections and how food felt like a natural way to bring that together. And then I think that the the real like, okay, rubber meets the road, what are you doing? And coming to start The Table Less Traveled was um, the small business I was talking about that I was working for was actually my aunt and uncle's company. And they were the ones who sat me down. I, I said, hey, can I take you out for dinner and ask you about my resume and what I should be looking for in the next job? And they said, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, they took they, they we went out to dinner and first they said we're buying. Second, they said we are not going to critique your resume because we think that you should go and try and do something that you're passionate about. Now is a perfect time mm-hmm. in your life to start a company. You have very little risk, you have very little obligation, you don't have any kids or other people that you have to take into consideration. You can kind of be a little bit selfish in pursuing something that would really change your life and and feed your soul. So that was kind of really where where I got the motivation to say I'm going to take this risk. I'm going to step step outside my comfort zone and I'm I'm going to go for it. Oh, that's awesome. I loved how you shared about being in Chile and not being able to communicate, but food was your way of communicating. Um it just reminded me of um 
just the fun times I had. I grew up in an Italian family and also Eastern European Slovak. So anytime we got together, it was all around food, right? <laughs> like that was the reason. And those just have some really fond memories for me because my great grandmother didn't speak an ounce of English. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for her, her love language was food. Like, so she would always just have all this food and like make sure everybody gathered at the table and just, um, you know, just reminded me of a little bit of what you're, you experienced maybe in Chile, um, just how there's, uh, I don't know, there's a connection, like you said, um, with that culture and with people um, around food. Um, and I would say, I mean, would you agree that, you know, we as travelers can go to another country and maybe go to a restaurant, but that might be a whole different experience versus what you are offering at the table less travel, correct? Yes. So to answer your question, going backwards a little bit about what we do at the table less mm -hmm. traveled is um, when I had done that trip, I kept a blog. Uh, it was really more for myself. I don't think blogging was really that big of a thing at that time. And my biggest reader was my mom. <laughs> she was also my proofreader. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I have an audience of two, my mom and me. But I think because of that, there were a few people within our network of family and friends who obviously knew that I was gone on this six month adventure. And people did start asking me within that small community of, hey, you know, I'm going here. Have you been there? How did you meet people? And so that was part of the starting of the Table Less Traveled is I realized I had these wonderful connections and relationships and this network that I had built around the world with people who were open and open to inviting people into their homes to have these more in-depth experiences, dinners and lunches mm -hmm. and, you know, standing around the table and having conversations and making the finishing touches of the dessert and all of those kinds of things that I think bring a place to life a little bit more. Um, and so I had started building experiences for people where I could host them and introduce them to our local friends. And so right now, our primary focus is bringing people to Italy, Peru, Malaysia, and Japan. And we invite people into people's homes. We do cooking classes with them. They teach us their family recipes. They share stories. You know, it's those little moments, I think, that are not planned and that are not mm -hmm. organized in a way that real life comes yes. to the surface. So, you know, some of my favorite memories are things like there's this wonderful friend, Marika, that has a beautiful house above Positano. And her dad comes walking up the stairs one evening while we're all having dinner and he's opening his homemade liqueurs for everybody sitting around the table, chatting and laughing into the evening. You know, we did have a planned driver who was waiting for us. And it's like, I kept calling him and saying, Hey, just 30 more minutes. Hey, just 30 more minutes because everybody was having so much fun and mm -hmm. having such a good time. Mm -hmm. And those are the types of connections that we try to make for people so that, you know, not everybody has the opportunity to spend six months traveling and a month sitting at a restaurant or a bar kind of shooting the shit, excuse my language, and happening to meet somebody who's a local that's willing to invite them into the home. And so we have these relationships where we feel honored to be able to make those introductions and kind of fast track the relationship component so that on a shorter experience of a week or 14 days, people have that opportunity um, to meet real people and get a real slice of life in the countries they're visiting. That's so awesome. Do you um, have a lot of solo travels, travelers that take advantage of that experience that you offer? We do. We had fewer before COVID and now we have probably an average of two to three solo travelers on every trip that we're running. And in becoming friends with these people, because our very small team of five, one of us is always on one of these trips hosting and introducing, like I said, yeah. travelers to our friends and getting to know the solo travelers who have come on these adventures. I think a common theme is this desire to explore, but also the richness that comes with sharing experiences with others. 
And for me, I know I did a lot of solo travel. And one of the things that I loved about um, meeting other people or traveling with other people was the opportunity to kind of be solo, but share memories with others where I could draw back on those things. And it always seemed to be a little bit more foundational for me when I could chat about it with somebody else Mm -hmm. and say, oh my gosh, remember when blah, 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 and have a comrade in that, you know, a friend, somebody else who, who understood what that felt like, understood what that meant. Yes. Yes. I think that's a, um, you know, a lot of people that are hesitant about solo travel, that is, you know, two things. They, they don't really want to be alone technically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, your setup kind of allows for a community, not just a cultural experience, but community. Um, but I also like the fact that, you know, a lot of people want to share these experiences with others, even though they're traveling solo. So it sounds like um, the table less traveled is a great way uh, to do that, you know, connecting with other people, um, developing that community, and even just, you know, having those rich culinary um, and cultural experiences that you're offering. I think that's amazing. Better than, Thank sorry you. to say, better than just a regular, uh, cooking class you might take in another country. I mean, I just, <laughs> I just feel like this is like you said, because there's that camaraderie, there's that conversation that happens. And it just, it truly is kind of that immerse immersion, you know, that, that people are experiencing, which is beautiful. What would, has been your most interesting culinary experience for you? <laughs> <laughs> any, any, uh, any weird things you've eaten? Like, you know, I think of oh. Anthony Borde- Bourdain and how he, he, he just experienced everything and he tasted so many like wild things that I would probably never touch. Have you had any, anything like that? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. I mean, my mentality and philosophy when I was, when I, period, but especially when I was traveling on the, that six month journey was I will try almost anything at least once. And so if it was offered to me, I was going to eat it. And then, you know, in so many cultures, if you're offered something, it's, it's rude to decline. So sometimes, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, I had to try things twice that I may not have wanted to. (laughs) Um, I think the, the, The funniest one to me that is not going to do it justice, it's one of those things where I feel like you had to be there, is that my best friend was um, in the Peace Corps during the time that I was doing this experience. And I stayed with her for two weeks in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa Mm. and way, way out there where there was spotty electricity, there was no running water. So we fetched water every morning. And she, of course, had this wonderful community of people in this very small village where she was working. And one of the teachers invited us over for dinner. And I did not really understand what that meant, but he had gone to the market and pulled all of the innards of a cow, let's just put it that way, into this pot that stewed for six hours while we were drinking Savannah dries, if anybody knows that hard cider from South Africa. And so I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this is going to be delicious. And it looks like there's all this seasoning in it. Well, when they served it, it was not seasoned. It was dark because it wasn't fully cleaned on the inside. (laughs) And so it was not pleasant, (laughs) but I ate the whole thing and it was kind of a bad thing because at the time I didn't realize that if you eat all of it, it's a sign that you love it so much that they're going to refill your plate. And so then they refilled my plate and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't bear to eat this again. I don't know how I survived that. And the best part was the next morning after a night full of you can only imagine your best friend from high school giggles all night long yeah. about how terrible it was. You know, we go to the school that she was teaching at in the morning. And one of the other teachers was like, Annie, I brought this local delicacy because it's your last day here. And so at 10 a.m., they were reheating essentially the same thing that I had the night before. Oh, my gosh. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't, I can't imagine how how I'm going to stomach this one more time, but I did it. I survived. 
And it's funny because before that, I was never off put by any of the innards. And after that, it's just like one of those scar tissue memories that I just can't do it anymore. (laughs) I I hear you. Oh, wow. And you didn't get sick? I didn't get sick. Thank goodness. No. That's good. That's good. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's an interesting, very uh, funny story. But what about when you were with a group? Was there some, uh, you know, when you were with your tour group? Did you have anything that didn't go as planned? You know, I like to hear those kind of interesting stories there that, and how did it turn out, you know? (laughs) Oh, yes. I mean, there are always things that don't go as planned. And one of the three things that we tell people in our small group, so our groups, our groups are very small, they're intimate, they're a maximum of 12 people. And so at the end of a trip, it definitely feels like your little travel family. That's how I feel, which is yeah. why I'm still close friends with the people who started out as clients or travelers with us. You know, I had brunch with one couple last weekend. Um, I'm having brunch with somebody else this weekend. They often come over and we hang out. So it builds this close relationship. But one of the things that we share with people at the beginning of a trip is kind of three ground rules. And one of them is to be flexible and be open Mm -hmm. because no matter how many plan B, C, D, E, F, G we have, and we do, it's travel and things come up and things change and you can't control everything. And I, I think that that was something I had to learn the hard way is being somebody who is super organized and always wanted things to go a certain way that there are just factors that you can't control. And so with our tour groups, you know, that's something that I've also learned as somebody who's kind of hosting and coordinating that I also have to be flexible and then really share the opportunities that we have to get to do something different than maybe what was planned. Mm -hmm. And so one of the famous ones that happens for me is that in Italy, we start our experiences in the Amalfi Coast. I had mentioned our friend Marika, where we have dinner at her home. And we used to take a private boat from Sorrento to Capri to visit another one of our friends, Domenico, and have lunch with his family. And um, sorry about that. (laughs) And um, without fail, it would be September, beautiful weather for the past six months. And it would start raining the day that I would land. And I told you, I'm from Seattle. And there is this curse that everybody says people from Seattle have where they take the rain with them everywhere. And so I would just, you know, kind of, what am I supposed to do? Part of the reason that you go to the Amalfi Coast is for the beauty and the sun and being outdoors and visiting these friends. People were always so patient and understanding. I can't control the weather. So of Mm -hmm. course we had backup plans. We had other things that we would do. And Sometimes it would lead us into other situations that we would have really wonderful connections. There was a vineyard that we used to visit that was near um, Mount Vesuvius, which was really Mm. beautiful and gave people an opportunity to taste wines that they wouldn't necessarily taste because the soil is very specific when you're talking about anywhere that's volcanic Mm. uh, soil. And, um, and then meeting different families who own that vineyard and, and so interesting things that come up in that place. But it, I, I swear, Cheryl, it's like without fail, I have a friend who lives in Positano who owns a small boat company, the one that we used to work with. And she will send me messages if it's been like six months of beautiful weather and say it rains. She'll say, Annie, did you just come to Italy? (laughs) Are you in the area? Because it's raining today and we had to cancel all of our boat tours. And, you know, I would say there's a, there have been a good number of times where I laugh and I say, I seriously, Elizabeth, I swear, I actually got to Sorrento last night. (laughs) Oh, so So it was true. (laughs) It it happens frequently to me. So yes, yes. But it sounds like, I mean, I think the advice you give is, you know, being flexible, knowing plans change. I think that's just a general, I mean, as a traveler, I mean, it's a lesson. And I think we all learn and we all have to, you know, accept and agree with. I mean, honestly, the best 
memories I have when I travel is, is, are those times that didn't go as planned because mm-hmm. usually something else comes out of it that, you know, you weren't expecting, right. And it might be pleasant. It might not be, you know, but it's always a funny memory usually. So, <laughs> you know, oh, for sure. and yeah. you know, it's a mindset shift to me as well to think about. And, and I try to share this with others too, even just the simple words of saying something like, oh, well, now I have to go do this other thing. Being able to say, oh, I get to go do this other thing Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have been able to do if that plan had gone accordingly is also a fun way for me to keep that positive momentum in the change and this opportunistic, in a good way, mindset of silver lining and like, oh, I get to experience something new. And so I, I try to infuse that openness into the travel experiences that we have and encourage travelers like you were talking about to just to just be really open to possibilities and what can happen along the way. Yeah. Excellent. And you mentioned a couple locations that you uh, currently go to. Can you list those again? And then are there any plans to, you know, expand to other cities or locations? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> I'm, I'm always plotting on the back end. Yay! Um, yes. So right now we have trips in Italy, Peru, Malaysia, and Japan. And one of the silver linings, a get to opportunity of being in the travel industry during COVID was that we started doing virtual cooking classes And the same people who we visit on our tours were the first people that we called to say, hey, can you teach, you know, your grandmother's recipe for X, Y, Z. And so through that experience, we made so many connections with people around the world in different countries who contacted us and said, I love what you're doing and I want to be a part of it. And can I teach my recipes? And so we have these home cooks that we've made relationships with in a lot of different destinations. And we're really you know, I don't think it will happen this year. And so I'm a little hesitant to be like, yes, for sure, this place. But over the next two to three years, we're hoping to expand in some of those countries where we have really close relationships are uh, France, Portugal, um, Costa Rica, India, Spain, Mm. wow, Argentina, Chile, So we're kind of, I mean, South Africa is another one. So we have a a lot of options on the table. And one of the things that I like to do when we're looking at a new destination is take a handful of those and talk to the people who've traveled with us before, because most of our travelers travel with us again. They say, hey, I, I, I love going with you. Wherever you go, I'll go. But if they have a hey, you know, I'd really like to go to South Africa, then we try to build our new experiences around where our existing travelers would like us to take them and like our style of travel and introduction to the communities as a way to, um, you know, continue providing something interesting for the community that we have. Yeah, that's awesome. Those are a lot of uh, great places, uh, <laughs> expansive, you know, there's that's a lot of expansion if you end up adding a lot of those locations, but that's exciting. And I like how you're kind of surveying um, people to see, you know, where do they want to go? Um, I liked, I liked almost all those places you mentioned. So, (laughs) but can you share with my audience where they can find you? Um, You know, I know you have a website, you know, social media, anything like that. And I'll make sure I include it also in the notes. So tell us where they can find you. Yes. Thank you. Our website is, the table less traveled.com and we're on social media also the table less traveled and we try to share on our social media some tips and tricks and more um places we love things that we encourage so that people can use it as a source of inspiration in their travels and not just hey, come travel with us because we know that it is for some people, not for everybody, but we still want to be able to encourage that connection and inspiration for anybody in our community. Well, thank you so much, Annie, for sharing all that. It's an exciting and it's a wonderful concept. Um, I believe a lot of people, you know, the foodies out there, hello, go ahead and connect up with Annie and the, the table less traveled. So thank you again for your time, Annie. I loved it.
Thank you, Cheryl. And I do have to say that uh, I have listened to a bit of your podcast and I just love what you do and how you're encouraging people to travel and to travel solo. I think there's so much value in that and there's so much growth and learning and opportunity and it doesn't matter what age you are there's so much that can be learned from taking the time to have an adventure on your own and to share that beautiful experience with other people so I just I love what you're doing and and I hope that everybody listening uh, is inspired by your message and the things that you share thank you thank you I appreciate that Well, thank you again, Annie, and I'll make sure we get all those social media connections in the notes so people can connect with you and your group. Thank you again. Thank you. Hey, sister travelers. Did this podcast inspire and encourage you or move you to get out there and travel? Wonderful. There are three ways you can thank me. First one is leave a written review for the show on Apple Podcast. Two, Share the show with your sister travelers, your friends, your family. And three, subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And thank you again for listening to the show. Sisters, be fearless, take the leap, and get out there and have an adventure.